the Japan that I work on of the 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries is actually a central uh, area in entrepot and trade um, and exchange throughout um, Eurasia. So it's from that perspective that I come uh, to my talk uh, today. Before I begin, I'd like to um, thank uh, everyone who's been so very helpful um, in uh, arranging my visit uh, and to thank uh, Dr. Zhao for inviting me to participate. Um, I um, am very eager to share uh, my materials uh, with you today uh, on the topic that you see um, on the screen. Uh, my approach today in speaking is I'm not going to read uh, from a lecture. I've been doing a lot of that recently, and I feel um, I would much prefer to do a more interactive uh, conversation. So in a moment, I'm going to get down off the podium and walk around as I speak. The um, PowerPoint presentation is structured in a way that we go through a series of sections, clearly labeled, and then uh, toward the end um, of my talk today, as I think you typically do, we'll have uh, several minutes, um, maybe 10 to 15 minutes, for an open discussion. However, just to um, set the, the, uh, the ground, the path for uh, the, my talk today, I will take um, a couple of questions as I move along if you find something that um, you can't quite, um, you didn't hear me properly, you have a question about it, um, I'll accommodate at the end of each section a couple of questions. Um, however, for longer discussion, we're going to wait um, toward the end. So my focus is going to be today um, a monument that you see um, on the screen. Uh, it's uh, uh, a particularly well-known, um, one of uh, perhaps Japan's most famous sites uh, a well-known uh, place constructed, a pavilion constructed, uh, dedicated around 1053. Um, it is greatly treasured uh, by um, most uh, Japanese scholars. It's, a, a, again, understood as a natural, a natural and natural um, treasure uh, in Japan um, dating to uh, the 11th century. There's really, some, there's, uh, really um, nothing quite like um, this site. It has a very unique uh, framework, a very unique um, approach in its construction. Those are issues that I'm going to uh, point out to you uh, today. But before, I'd like to tell you a little bit um, about the building. It was dedicated um, in 1053, and um, its connection with the two names that I brought up at the beginning of the lecture, uh, Fujiwara Michinaga and his son, Fujiwara Yorimichi, um, in many um, aspects, it is a product of the kind of challenges and cultural productions that they engaged in uh, from around the end of the 10th century into um, the early 11th century. As you can see, uh, it has been restored just recently. I took some photographs of it um, when I was visiting. Um, and uh, it's been uh, restored fairly uh, recently to um, its original appearance. It sits on a lake that surrounds it. It's a very unusual uh, format. I'll be explaining that uh, much more uh, clearly in just a moment. Um, it is a monument that is so beloved in Japan, and it is understood to be a particularly representative example of Japanese aesthetics and Japanese tradition. I don't disagree with that, but I have a few other views um, about this that I'm going to share with you um, as we go along with our lecture today. So why do we know that it is such a, an important monument in the history of Japanese culture, it appears um, on the obverse of the Japanese 10 yen coin, uh, for instance. It's um, clearly, you can, uh, we can see it um, there at the center um, of the coin. I should get my pointer. Um, and it, as such, it's, it's understood, again, to be um, particularly uh, representative of the Japan that perhaps is now lost today, the Japan of traditional Heian uh, period when uh, the city of Kyoto was a center um, of uh, Japanese culture and civilization. Uh, and so, again, the, the, uh, the Phoenix Hall, as it's called, and I'll explain that in just a moment, um, is a very important site. And so when one asks questions about it, it sometimes gets to be a little bit controversial, especially when one starts to consider the possibility that it's not simply the product of only Japanese taste, but it involves a very educated knowledge 
uh, on the part of Yorimichi, its patron, and his father, Michinaga, a very sophisticated knowledge of continental culture in this period, which comes as a surprise to um, many. And we'll be um, raising that issue as we go along today. So it's called the Phoenix Hall, um, and it's actually an Amitabha Hall. Amida, the Buddha of the Western Paradise, is enshrined on the interior. We'll see that um, in a moment. Uh, and it's at, a, at a, it's a temple called Byodoin um, in the city of Uji. Uh, that's about 15 miles south of uh, the city of Kyoto today. And uh, so it's really quite close to uh, the major center of uh, Kyoto uh, Japanese culture, uh, let's say at the, the, the turn of the 11th century. Um, you can see it has, uh, it's very symmetrically arranged. It looks um, almost perfect in, in sort of um, balance and symmetry. Uh, and it's reflected on the surface of the lake that surrounds it. So it's understood to be a very beautiful site as well. As we'll uh, learn in a moment, the area around it is also very famous. There's a region of um, this, the uh, scenic landscape of uh, Uji, which is on the, bay, on the uh, banks of the um, Uji River. So um, when we think about the term Phoenix Hall, uh, we think also of the structure of the Buddha that's on the interior, um, the Amida Buddha, the Buddha of the Western uh, Paradise, Amitabha, uh, uh, this very large uh, statue, about 10 feet in height, the statue itself, gilt uh, wood. Uh, we're going to talk a great deal more about that in a moment, but I'm just basically introducing you to the main features of the structure, and then I'll move on to a series of sections where we're going to interrogate and ask questions um, about this um, this uh, particular Buddha, his hands uh, and the site and the program uh, surrounding um, the uh, plans and uh, the structure itself, the iconographic program, uh, the painting program, and so on. Uh, so we'll hear a lot more about this interior in a moment. The um, Buddha has its hands in a gesture of meditation, not teaching, its hands are seated like this, so he's in a state of meditation. Were he to be teaching, his hands would be up like this. We'll see some examples in a moment. So that's an important point where we're going to return to that um, in a moment. So inside the central structure of the Amida Hall is, or the Phoenix Hall, is this particular uh, structure, this statue. Why is it called the Phoenix Hall? Actually, it wasn't called the Phoenix Hall um, in the 11th century when it was constructed, let's say between 1050 and 1053. Um, since the 18th or 19th century, it's been referred to as the Phoenix Hall. One reason, it has very large uh, gilt bronze, originally gilt bronze phoenixes at each end of its eaves. That's unique. There aren't many structures like this. So that's one of the reasons. The other reason is that the hall, when we look at it um, from an aerial view, remembering that this is, um, excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, um, this uh, points, uh, this is east over here, west, um, north, uh, and south. The other um, reason that it's called the Phoenix Hall is it has the shape of a bird in flight. Uh, and another very unique feature, L-shaped corridors. Here's the main hall, L-shaped corridors with turrets to each side. It sits on a lake of some sort. Um, and the tail corridor extends behind it. So it looks like a bird in flight. There's nothing like this in um, Japanese uh, architectural uh, precedent uh, before this period. So we're going to be thinking about that a bit later, but I'm just laying out some themes that I want to return to repeatedly over the course of our lecture. So um, who are the people that I'm focusing on in particular? Now we understand many people were involved in a construction of a site such as um, the Phoenix Hall. But in particular, I'm focusing on two members of the Fujiwara family, Field of Fuji. We see uh, the Fuji plant up here, the wisteria, that's what that term means. The family takes its name from the wisteria vine. I'm interested in that because like a wisteria vine, they wound themselves around the central political structure, um, the royals, the emperors of Japan. So they're, I think it's a good idea. They're called the, they took the name Fuji, um, wisteria. In particular, I'm interested in um, Fujiwara Michinaga, there's his dates here, and his son Yorimichi. I think their activities will help us understand how something as unique, and I agree that it is unique, as the Phoenix Hall was constructed in Japan in the 11th century, when nothing like it had been built before, and why that structure sort of asks us to look 
bro more broadly about its origins and also about the activities of these two particular and very interesting figures. Why do I know so much about them? I've spent the past decade or so um, nosing around in their diaries. I read everything they write about um, every aspect of their lives. So I feel like a voyeur on the one part, on the one hand, and like a good friend in another. I'm trying to bring their world um, into ours. And one way to do it, I think, is to consider um, the Phoenix Hall, um, uh, as we'll be discussing it today. So what kind of place, Uji, that this is important also, a, a really fascinating uh, story in the history of this building is why the city of Uji was selected. So just thinking about it, here's Kyoto. So I just, I'm, I pay a lot of attention to sort of um, the uh, landscape, um, choices made in terms of scenery and so on for the construction of Buddhist uh, sites. I think this is characteristic across the board. I've seen it in China. I've seen it elsewhere where um, Buddhist monasteries in particular uh, areas for meditation are often constructed in ver at very beautiful sites on the banks of a river. So um, speaking of which, if we go down here, here's Uji. Um, so it's pretty much it's south um, and east of, of the capital, but it was uh, it, usually um, they took, they went down by uh, ship, by boat, uh, but occasionally overland by horseback. It was about a day's journey um, in the 11th century. Um, and Uchi uh, had been there a long time before uh, the Phoenix Hall was constructed. It's on the banks of the Uji River, also called the Yodo River, that fro flows out of uh, Lake Biwa up here, down through the mountains, past here. We're going to be focusing on this site right here, and then on down uh, to Osaka. So, Osaka Bay. So it's, a, it's um, a, an area, a scenic area in the mountains, um, celebrated in poetry, uh, going back at least several generations before this structure uh, was built, the Phoenix Hall. Um, so a little bit more about the complex itself. So they, uh, they decided on a site. Uchi had many villas uh, that were uh, in the Fujiwara family before Michinaga. He inherited villas, um, and so did Yorimichi. Um, and in so doing, uh, Yorimichi turned his villa into a monastery uh, called Byodoin. And the first building um, he constructed, Fujiwara uh, Yorimichi, as I have up on the screen, um, was this one. It was, uh, he turned his living residence, his residence, his residential quarters into a temple. Um, he converted it to the main hall. It had a great statue of um, the cosmic Buddha on the interior. We'll come back to that. We don't, it's gone. We don't have um, uh, any representations of that building and what was inside it, but we have a good guess. So you can see um, Japanese scholars have reconstructed um, the site based on archeological uh, work and so on. The only structure that remains, I should per perhaps make this clear, is the Phoenix Hall is the only building that remains of this complex. But originally it was a very big um, complex on the, uh, on the western bank um, of the Uji uh, River. And um, after that, he constructed the Byodoin, uh, the, Amita, the Amida Hall, as he called it. We call it the Phoenix Hall, up to the north um, in, in this area here, looking out um, on the river. So that's basically uh, what we have. And the uh, monastery, Byodoin itself, grew enormously through the 12th century um, and was a major site for visits from the royal family and so on going on into the 13th century. And it has remained a very important site. But this is the only building um, that remains. And here's a reconstruction again by the scholars um, showing us uh, the Phoenix Hall and the small hall that was um, set across the lake from it to allow for uh, viewing and chanting um, of uh, sutras and so on um, in celebrating uh, the Buddha on the interior. So my goal today is to go through over the next hour or so um, through a series of um, sections. First, I will set out to you what I think to be the distinctive aspects of this building. And during these, um, as I go through each section, uh, so the distinctive features, that's uh, section one, the building, the statue, the paintings, iconographical program, and so on. At that point, if you have any questions, hand up, ask me a brief question, I can respond. If you are um, not following what I'm saying. But I think I'm gonna provide enough information so that at the end of, the dis of, of my presentation, we can have a, a, a talk um, about some of the issues I've raised. Next, uh, we'll think about tipping points. What do I mean by that? 
I haven't uh, raised another really important aspect of this building. It was constructed following a period of great turbulence um, in Japan, but also across Eurasia. I'm referring to these periods as tipping points, um, uh, and uh, there's a contemporary language we often use for this. There was a great deal more trans-regional exchange from the 1990s, um, as I'll explain in a moment. Catastrophe, we'll see why I'm interested in this in a second. And the Buddhist eschaton, the sense that people believed that the Buddhist dharma, the Buddhist world, was going to quickly come to an end, the middle of the 11th century. So we'll return to that as we go along. My third section, the Fujiwaras. I'll tell you a little bit what I know about these individuals and what I know about their activities as patrons. They were magnificent patrons of the arts. In fact, some people compare the family to the Medicis um, in Florence and other um, great families of Europe. Um, and then I'll uh, conclude with a discussion of the, what I understand to be the aspects of the Phoenix Hall that link it to continental practices and that make it very special. And then I'll conclude uh, with a rumination on what I think it might have been its role um, as a building uh, dedicated to Amida, but also intended for many other purposes, I would argue, um, in this period. So the building, let's uh, think about it a little bit more carefully, and I'll get into some technical details here. Um, it is um, typically understood um, to be, yes, in the shape of this L-shaped plan in the shape of a bird, I guess. Um, it has a main central hall here, and then these uh, L-shaped corridors. I've mentioned that before. It sits on an island. The lake surrounds it entirely. This is unusual. Um, we'll return to that. Um, typically, an Amida hall looks something like this, a square building with a pyramidal roof. This is from Shiramizu Amida Do up in the area where I lived for a long time uh, in Japan, up in uh, northern Japan. So typically, this is the kind of building that was constructed for Amida um, in this period. Um, but Yorimichi did something radically different. He built this kind of structure. Um, it was also situated near water on the bank, uh, very close to the Uji River, which is right down here, uh, flowing this way from the Lake Biwa area. Uh, you can see uh, the lake around it. It sits on a sandbank, an island. It's often called a Suhama, S-U-H-A-M-A, -A, um, like a sandbar in a river on the ocean or something. Um, situated on that. You can get some sense of scale. A bunch of people gathered there on the front veranda. It faces east uh, toward the river um, Uji flowing past it. If you stand over here or you're down here and look out in the landscape, um, there's uh, a very famous Uji River Bridge, but it's a very beautiful part of um, scenic area south of um, Kyoto and where many, many villas were constructed, where people go today to hike. It's a very beautiful place. And much of um, Japanese poetry called waka, the na native form, W-A-K-A, -A, uh, has uh, references to Uji, a beautiful place, uh, particularly in the autumn with the autumn leaves and so on. So the site is um, very important, um, and that's one of the distinctive features um, of the hall. Also, it looks like it's um, two stories tall, but instead, it's, it's actually, um, it actually has a layer, uh, a pent roof or a, a kind of uh, enclosure around it that isn't uh, weight-bearing. So it's actually one story with these um, enormous eaves out to each side. I'm focusing on the, um, the central hall um, in particular. Um, let me give you a sense of uh, the scale and the size of the building because this is going to become important in a moment. So let's not forget. Um, it's uh, the central area here. It's about 46 by um, uh, 36 feet, the central hall here. And then we have galleries to each side that extend uh, 46 feet. Uh, here are the 66 feet for the uh, tail quarters. So this gives you a, a sense of the scale. I think that's also um, important. And then the actual central hall is about 33 by 33 feet in size. It's actually quite small. And at the very center, this, this kind of hall is called a moya, the mother's co or core space in, in Buddhist architecture. That's what that green uh, word means, moya. Um, so that's the, the, the scale, um, and uh, if we think about it, here's the hall uh, that we've just looked at the measurements. We're now looking at it from the exterior. We know that it has lots of doors, and in fact, it has doors. Um, the statue of Amitabha is up here, uh, and it has doors that open out all around on uh, the eastern exposure to the north and to the south. 
and then one pair of doors to uh, the west. Um, that's how it's constructed um, today. So already it can be opened up to the environment around it. Um, but interestingly enough, um, the Japanese terms, I'll talk about them in a moment, refer to the kinds of paintings that are on uh, the doors um, of the hall. We'll come back to that in a second. So now let's think about the statue. What kind of statue is it and why is it so distinctive? First of all, it's very big for a rather small space. There's not a lot of room between uh, where the statue is, in, is uh, installed on its altar um, and the wall surrounding it. Um, the statue sits on this big lotus leaf. It has a flaming mandrola or uh, area behind it. But my concern now is to think about the statue proper. It's done in, uh, as I said, it's gilt uh, wood. Um, so it's covered uh, first in uh, lacquer mixed with dust and then over that goes a layer of uh, gilding tapped onto the surface of the uh, image. Now that's not particularly unusual. What's unusual about it, uh, first of all, is its stylistic aspects. Now by that I mean what does it look like to us? It looks like a very peaceful, symmetrical, shallowly carved, lean, slender, relaxed figure seated there in meditation. Um, has a very quiet surface, very carefully organized. This is distinctive. There's really no example like this earlier in this period. In fact, earlier statues, while similar, um, here's a, a statue of Amitabha, um, although I, you could argue this is a, a, a figure of the healing Buddha, and the scholars are debating this, but right now it's uh, identified as an Amitabha or um, Amida. Um, my point here is to compare um, what they look like. They're not that far apart, but the workshops are different. Um, and so we start to wonder, where did the artist who, uh, the group of artists, uh, and the, particularly the artist Jocho, J-O-C-H-O, come up with this particular format we see um, at the, um, uh, inside the Ami, Amida Hall, or the Phoenix Hall at Uji. Um, we can see over here, if we compare them visually, this has a little rougher surface. It looks a little sloppier. So this is a, a, a very distinctive um, approach. It's also much larger. This is about half the size um, of the statue on the right, which is uh, nearly, it's about nine feet tall or so. So uh, we have monumental statues um, and an interesting mudra, an interesting style mudra is the hand gesture. And then, uh, above all, it's constructed in a way that has been unheard of up to this period. Um, it is constructed with a series of in, a seri a kind of wood joinery, um, where many pieces of wood have been basically matched, glued together, there's no nails or anything used, and then lacquer covers it to hold everything in place, and then we have that seamless object that we looked at a moment ago, the Amida itself. So this is called Yosegi, it's called Y-O-S-E-G-I, it means joining wood together. So this is a very distinctive technical development. It's an advance. Why? Uh, one of the uh, reasons for this is possibly because of the demand for very large statues. This is the most efficient way to produce statues. What it means for us is that it's hollow on the interior. And so surprisingly, on the interior, of all things, a surprise, again, is a moon disk set atop a lotus pedestal. So, this moon disk contains some chants or syllables used in invoking the Buddha, Amida, to come into the room or to enter the space. Um, so it's a, diff it's a very interesting development because, as I'll, we'll talk about in a moment, most of the iconography relates to the worship of Amida and what's called the Pure Land School of Buddhism. This points to another school of Buddhism that focuses on chanting of Dharani, of secret teachings, and so on. But for our purposes right now, this um, on the interior of the statue is another way of, kind of perhaps a redundant way, of um, focusing on the role of the Amida at the center of the Byodawin, the Phoenix Hall, and the Phoenix Hall itself as representing in one way or another the land of bliss, a place where one is reborn, um, reborn uh, whether one is a sinner or not. Amida is a very compassionate deity, reborn into a beautiful place called Sukhavati, or Gokuraku in Japanese, or bliss. So that's part of the iconography we're going to take up as we go um, along. Uh, so the paintings, 
Another distinctive feature is I'm barraging you with information um, as a foundation for um, thinking about what some of this in, um, might mean for us in understanding uh, the Phoenix Hall. The paintings. All around the structure, on all the walls and doors, are a series of paintings done in malachite and azurite um, on the wood panels. Um, we can see them there. Here, if we turn, um, if we put ourselves in the situation of the, in the position of the Buddha, here are the eastern doors, the center door and to the north and to the south. Now, the center door is, has been lost. The paintings have been lost, and the paintings to, the, to each side are now mounted elsewhere, and they've been um, for preservation, and uh, we see uh, replicas there today. What were those paintings? Um, a series of beautiful landscapes, panoramic landscapes. Again, astonishing. This kind of material is not something I found ever in earlier Buddhist halls that I visited. The statue is surrounded by um, panoramic views of mountains receding off into the distance. It's very green, comforting. Green is a good color. Malachite is very... Um, I think comforting, if there's a reason that we find green in hospitals, for instance, malachite was used by um, the Romans for healing wounds. So it's a very, the idea that it has a lot of green inside and blue indicates, um, I think, that it's a safe place of some sort. Um, also, the paintings have, as you can see in this reconstruction, the green hills, the view, the vista, then scenes of Buddhas coming down with entourages into areas with little houses um, and so on. So the paintings are rendered this way. If you were, let me back up, if, let's say you're standing here um, looking east. If you were to pull open these doors, and again, these are hinged, pivot hinged doors, they open up. You can stand in front, open up, and then you would see across, oh, excuse me, you would see across from you um, the Uji landscape all around. So there's a very interesting redundancy also that many scholars, Akiyama, Terukazu, and others have done a lot of work on this. <clears throat> so in thinking about this, I'm kind of standing on their shoulders. But I think it's fascinating that you have a series of paintings um, in this pavilion that in many ways uh, reflect the surround as well. And it makes a very special place for the Phoenix Hall um, as a building and also in a specific kind of space. Um, so what is the iconographical program? By that I mean, what's the purpose for ritual? What would be the reason to have this kind of arrangement? Um, well, the hall itself um, clearly relates to the Buddha Amida um, as the very compassionate Buddha of the Western paradise. There are many scriptures that talk about how this Buddha will rescue, uh, will welcome into his paradise, which has nine levels and three degrees, basically, anyone, even the worst of sinners. They're just being uh, born on different levels of, um, in this realm of uh, rebirth. So most of the imagery goes to that, including all of these uh, shallow carvings in the upper levels um, of the hall as well that show a crowd of bodhisattvas. We'll talk about them more in a moment. Um, and each of these scenes has a cartouche um, that describes to us uh, it quotes from the, uh, uh, the Visualization Sutra, the Wuliang Shou uh, Jing, um, or the Gokuraku, or the Kamuryo Jukyo in Japanese, um, that uh, describes one of the levels of rebirth. So there's clearly a reference, um, and these are uh, squares of colored papers with inscriptions on them that were pasted onto the doors. So the, the, it tells us quite clearly that someone was thinking about rebirth in this context, in this beautiful realm. But the question is, is this the realm of Uji, or on the, painted on the walls, is Uji paradise, or is this a reference to um, the Buddhas coming into Uji and taking uh, the um, faithful away? And uh, most particularly important is that this is connected to a chant um, that, if repeated constantly, more or less guarantees your uh, rebirth in this Western paradise. So there's a series, it's a massive amount of information we're going through, but we'll return and um, sort it out a little bit more in a second. So um, this, uh, the hall itself is uh, arranged so that on the eastern side, they have the upper degree of rebirth on the north, and on, um, the, uh, on the south are other uh, paintings representing um, these levels of rebirth. And for instance, if we look over here, the 
upper level, middle birth. Um, we can find it in the painting here. The left uh, shows us the, uh, the painting that remains. It's in really terrible shape. And here's a reconstruction done by Japanese scholars. So this is a, a complex iconography. Um, it's probably what's called a pure land iconography. By pure land, a pure land is another way of saying gokurako or sakavati or the place where you go to be reborn in uh, Buddha's paradise. So it has very strongly, it has that um, element of um, uh, iconography. Um, but there are other interesting features. Um, you'll notice uh, both over here and in the reconstruction, Buddha arrives, he has his hands in a teaching gesture with a cloud of flying celestials and bodhisattvas. And that's exactly what's represented up on the shallow relief carvings up in the upper registers above the beams in the hall. So there too, we have a, a direct a point set on Pure Land iconography. Um, <clears throat> and it's true that um, when uh, ceremonies were later held in the 12th century, <clears throat> something I wrote about in my, um, an essay uh, many years ago, uh, there were uh, uh, practices, rituals held at twilight in particular of chanting uh, the name of um, Amida as part of the ritual uh, process. And you can see a, an example of the kind of structure uh, that some scholars believe the Byodoin was probably based on. And it goes to um, uh, China, uh, Dunhuang, uh, the Mogao Caves. Uh, this would be uh, eighth, early ninth centuries potentially. So that's the way that this is usually understood. And these are called um, uh, transformed or pictorialized visions of this, um, the text called, uh, the text that teaches this particular uh, chant um, and the particular idea of visual having 16 contemplations which are listed along the sides here that will lead you gradually to um, a moment of uh, understanding enlightenment and maybe rebirth um, in the paradise of the Buddha. So this is um, one particular, it fits into a Pure Land category of iconography and so on. Um, in Japan it's especially famous um, as the Taima Mandala uh, that's in the 8th century. It's a textile, but I can, you can see it directly links to Chinese uh, prototypes in uh, Dunhuang, for instance. Here's an example from the Met much later, but it shows us the same format uh, and um, the visualizations to each side. So I'm not going to go into this, but it's to show us that there is definitely a precedent for this kind of uh, iconographical approach. And I've argued in an essay in the Art Bulletin that I've, maybe this this... Phoenix Hall was actually an attempt to build a 3D version of what we see on the screen. Maybe. I've, I've, I've re reconsidered some aspects of that. Um, I don't think I was wrong necessarily, but I think there's more um, to the story. Here's a close-up. The, visual, the, the visualization practice is here, but you can see this particular structure. But we notice typically that the Buddha in all of these scenes of uh, the Buddha in his in the world of bliss, the realm of bliss, he has his hands in a gesture of teaching. His fingers are up, he's moving, he's engaging. The Phoenix Hall has an Amida who has his hands in a gesture of contemplation and deep uh, interiority. So it's not a kind of forthcoming um, image. So that's a distinctive feature uh, that may tell us about other possibilities. That the, um, the Phoenix Hall um, Amida and its iconographic program also points to tantric practices, secret teachings, chanting of Dharani, and so on, because that's exactly what we have on the interior. This is, uh, it's, uh, a sans it's called Siddham, it's Sanskrit, uh, Brahmi uh, script. At the center is Om, and then around are two chants, and if you chant them, um, Buddha appears, Amida appears and he glows all red. I did forgot to mention that one of the stunning things about, and uh, this is also unprecedented, uh, restorers discovered on looking at the interior um, of the Buddha Amida inside the Phoenix Hall, painted red. It's a glowing red. The whole surface is a very narrow, a beautifully refined interior, not chopped up and just left to, just carefully finished. And that coincides with this set, the, the, the text that says, once you chant these Dharani, they start working on their own, and the Buddha um, takes on a red glow. Okay, speak up. Yes, 
Yes, that's a good question, and I would argue that the, the mudra itself, and that's a very, that's a useful observation. This mudra is connected with all visions of Amida when he's shown in a tantric context. The hands are down like this. So this means a deep interior meditation where you merge effectively with the cosmic Buddha. Now in this case, cosmic Buddha, what does that have to do with this? Another really interesting feature, going to the tantric element, is up here in the top of the mandorla of this statue, which is itself, rather than showing clouds and so on, <clears throat> it appears to be on a, a kind of um, uh, flaming mandala. At the very top, over here, we find the cosmic Buddha, Mahavairochana, in his hand and a teaching, in, his, in a it's typical gesture of a very powerful tantric deity, the central deity, once everything emanates. So this is unprecedented. There aren't examples of this form of Mahavairochana with um, the uh, Amida Buddha, except in the tantric context. Also, if you'll think back, when uh, Yorimichi uh, converted his home into a Buddhist hall, he dedicated it to Mahavairochana, Dainichi Nyorai. And so that was the main deity of the entire complex. So there's a, a reason for this. But there's one more interesting feature um, that we'll return to toward the end. We're going to take a break in about 10 minutes, and then um, we'll start up from there. I'm trying to reach the break with a series of um, distinctive features. So um, another particularly interesting feature is that, um, for instance, in the middle level, upper berth, there are scenes showing uh, connections from poetry to um, Uji. For instance, deer in the fields. Um, in the early, uh, or horses in the fields in the early, uh, at the early spring, um, late winter. So over here it's being recon reconstructed. We're going to see this close up. There we are, and here they are. These are scenes directly relating to waka, to poetry. And we know that poetry in the waka tradition, uh, the poems are eventually written down, but like dharani, like spells, like chants, they're spoken. You speak the poem out first, and then it's transcribed. So there's another component to it, which I think is a it's kind of sonic world associated with this building that we'll be returning to um, later on. So I've set out that the, there are three iconographical or programmatic features that make it very interesting and very, I think, creative. It's a pure land hall that is also tantric, and it also involves poetry, um, secular poetry, poetry not necessarily related to Buddhist teachings. Um, and an architectural adventure. I'll go through this quickly, we'll take a break, and then I'll, um, we'll, we'll continue. Um, the building uh, has enormous eaves. Um, so I've g given you the um, information up here. They extend um, something like 13 feet out um, here from the pillars. They're more than half, almost half the size of transverse beams and about 64% of the pillars. What does this mean? The building is incredibly unstable. And very soon after it was built, it fell down. And it has been kept standing over generations, including modern architectural historians. Another strange, I would say weird uh, decision, and my Japanese colleagues also say it's in incomprehensible, is that the interior in this hall with huge pillars a huge eaves, so there's a, there's a kind of gravity problem there. They removed the pillars from the, here's where the statue sits, these two pillars have been eliminated. So there should be two pillars right there and right there, but they're gone. Why? So you can see the Buddha better. But the building itself is unstable. Um, another feature, uh, it sits on an island, on a wetland, which was never stable. Um, it's higher on this end than this end, and the building sank. Um, very soon after being constructed. So right there, there's this sense of it had to be built in this particular site, and even, I think, worse from the standpoint of um, Japanese architectural historians, it was very sloppy. Japan has an incredible tradition of uh, timber architecture. Nowhere is this level of sloppiness, uh, mismatched parts, uh, kind of an uneven, quick, it seems randomly, very, the, the, 
uh, Japanese scholars refer to it as, as basically very um, sloppy and very uh, lacking in common sense. Hijoshiki is the term they use for it. Um, before it was uh, restored to keep it standing, there's just kind of, it's just a jumble of um, architectural uh, parts, wooden uh, parts, that seems um, somehow too hasty. It's like it was pulled together very rapidly. Maybe not all the, the, the architects who were working on other projects had to deal with it. Hard to say. But this, too, asks, pushes us to ask questions about it. Plus, in the blue areas, the red are the gates, the doors that we have now. The blue areas were also um, open. So it had no weight-bearing walls, basically. So of course it fell down. It was a beautiful pavilion on the bank of a river, absolutely gorgeous. Looks like it would sort of fly, float away, um, and a gust of wind could bring it down. So this is very interesting from a much broader uh, perspective, and that'll help us understand some of the features that make it so special and maybe help us figure out what the uh, agenda was on the part of the two uh, patrons involved with it. So I've rushed us through the first sort of introductory section. Let's take a break and then we'll um, uh, start up again in a few minutes.